right, hi and welcome to our first session of the Theory Method Research Symposium series. As far as uh, webinars with large groups of people go, dialogue is very difficult. Uh, so the chat is currently open and you can say hi and where you're joining us from, if you would like. Uh, we are also going to have the question answer feature open and our colleagues from the Education Now Lab will be monitoring those. Uh, and we are recording, so we are hoping to have uh, some of this available later and, um, and hopefully have the, the transcription as well for you all. Uh, so with that, I'm going to now turn, my, turn the time over to my colleagues in the Education Now Lab who are going to, going to be making introductions for us tonight. So I believe Debbie, you are first up. The Theory Method Research Symposium Series is hosted by the Education Now Lab at Illinois State University in the School of Teaching and Learning and College of Education. We are a community engaged research and practice lab that engages in and produces a range of public, academic, and new media scholarship with and alongside community members as we work toward more just educational futures. The lab has been in a slow launch since 2020. It currently hosts five doctoral students and their research partners pursuing critical research at the intersection of education, literacies, technologies, and participatory approaches. We are hosting this series as part of a course called Conceptual Understandings in Education Research with Dr. Smith. We will be sharing our takeaways through social media throughout the semester at, at EduNowLab on both Twitter and Instagram. That's at E-D-U-N-O-W-L-A-B. You can also use the hashtag, hashtag theory method and tag at EduNowLab if you are sharing your thoughts tonight. Follow us here for more on this series. Missy? We are working to make meaningful in our course that Illinois State University was built on the land and the waters of multiple indigenous nations who were forcibly removed, including the Illini, Peoria, and the Miamia, and later due to the colonial encroachment and displacement to the Fox, Potawatomi, Sac, Shawnee, Winnebago, Iowa, Muscoutin, Kiankasha, We, and Kickapoo Nation. We also honor the indigenous people who we may have excluded due to historical erasure and inaccuracy. It is a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the Theory Method Research Symposium series, Dr. Ruben Gastambides Fernandez. As professor in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning at the University of Toronto, Dr. Gastambide Fernandez's work focuses on symbolic boundaries and the dynamics of cultural production and processes of identification in the educational context. Currently serving as the PI of the Urban Arts High Schools Project and the Youth Solidarities Across Boundaries Project, he demonstrates his commitment to theoretical work that focuses on the relationship between creativity, decolonization, and solidarity. Additionally, Dr. Gaztambide Fernandez is the editor-in-chief of the journal Curriculum Inquiry. Tonight, Dr. Gaztambide will be speaking on the use of theory in educational research. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Ruben Gastambide Fernandez. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. You did a marvelous job uh, pronouncing my last name. I know, I know that's a two of the fours. I usually tell people they just have to sing it uh, and it usually helps, but you, you, did, you did really well. Thank you for that. I appreciate your attention to that. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um it's wonderful to be here uh what a what a large group of people my god <laughs> i was not anticipating that but uh thank you to the doctoral students and dr smith's class for inviting me uh to share a little bit of thinking with you about theory and um 
and just to be in conversation with you. Yeah, it's always it's always a bit hard to uh, to really be in conversation online, but um, hopefully we'll we'll try that out. Uh, so first of all, I, I'm I'm speaking to you from the city that probably most of you know as Toronto, also known by indigenous people in this area as Takaronto. This is the territory of several different indigenous groups that uh, shared have shared uh, in this land uh, for many centuries since since time immemorial. It's been a, a zone of exchange amongst the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and Mohawk and the Anishinaabeg, the Algonquin. Uh, it's been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat. Uh, most recently, it's been taking care is the cares of this land of the Mississauga of the Credit River. Anishinaabeg and Ojibwe, um, and they are my hosts here. I am a guest in this territory. I'm originally from the island of Puerto Rico uh, that we know as Borinquen, um, and have been living here for 16 years, doing work with communities and trying to make contributions to the work of resisting ongoing colonization, uh, not just in the place I'm coming from, but also in the place where I am currently sharing of the land. Uh, this this territory is governed uh, by the Turo Wampong, which is an agreement for communities to live along each other and support each other, and by the Dish with One Spoon uh, agreement amongst indigenous people to use the land responsibly and share of the resources of the land. Uh, but like I said, this is a place that has historically been a place of exchange, uh, and so I feel that um, it's always in keeping with the historical and traditional uses of this land when we use it as a, as a way to exchange ideas um, and to share the knowledge that we generate in different places. And so I, I share with you uh, in acknowledgement of that commitment and, and in response to that commitment as a, as a responsibility I carry as a guest in this territory. Um, I want to give a, a bit of a caveat about what I'm going to share with you. Um, not a disclaimer so much, but a bit of a caveat. This was a this is the workshop that I have been giving uh, with an audience of authors in mind. So, um, as Megan mentioned, I, I am the editor in chief of a of a journal, an academic journal uh, called Curriculum Inquiry, and as part of that work. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with advanced doctoral students and early career scholars to help them uh, with their academic writing. And this was a, a workshop that I developed specifically with uh, authors in mind um, to help writers, academic writers, write with theory in mind and, and to write consistently with theory. Um, this is perhaps one of the biggest challenges, I think, uh, of the of learning to write about theory and in educational research, because educational research is so trans interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary uh, and education scholars are not necessarily often grounded or disciplined to write within a set of theoretical frameworks. It is, in fact, the opposite is often true that we're invited to be, uh, to be interdisciplinary and to be creative with theory. Uh, Gary Thomas, in an article that I know some of you read, talks about ad hocery, right? This idea of being ad hoc, of, of bringing concepts and theories in ad hoc matter, manner. And that can be really good, uh, but oftentimes it's quite challenging. It's quite challenging because theories are sometimes usually internally consistent. And when we start to marry one theory with another, we can create inconsistency. Uh, and that often comes through in the way that articles or pieces of writing uh, unfold that that we often find there's uh, gaps or, or or leaps in logic that creating conceptual inconsistencies, um, and so that's really sort of the background of of why I've been doing this uh, this workshop, and and it informs much of what I will say. That also means, and also because of the length of this, um, that I have to gloss over what are ultimately really really big differences, and and you will you will notice that in the examples that I give. Uh, and so really it, the disclaimer is in a sense that I know that I'm glossing over really significant differences and sometimes putting things together that don't necessarily belong together or that or that somebody might take might make an argument against the way that I've lumped them together. But, but I've done this as a, as a kind of heuristic to try to illustrate a point about the importance of 
making arguments and building arguments in ways that connect not the way that you see the world, the way that you perceive the world, and the way that you're mobilizing data and information and observations in order to make arguments. So I want to start by asking uh, the students in the class that invited me to participate uh, to think with me a bit and to share a little bit of their thinking with me. And those of you, I know there's a lot of you who are logging in from, from far away, you'll, you'll get to, uh, I'm sorry that you can't participate in this part of it, but I, I want to kind of generate some ideas as a group. So I've, I've sent them uh, a set of three prompts that they've been thinking about now for a few minutes, and hopefully uh, some of them will be willing to share their thinking. And so the, the first prompt that I usually give is, is to identify or make a list of three beliefs or three ideas about the world and about experience that ground the work that you do as a researcher. So three beliefs or three ideas. And, it, and if you're not part of the group, if, you're, if you can't participate, please feel free to write this down and perhaps uh, you can use it as a reference point as we converse uh, for the next half hour. So the second, the second prompt is to, is to name uh, the bodies of work um, the, the, the bodies of literature or the traditions that relate and support those three ideas or beliefs. It doesn't have to be scholarly. Uh, it, can be it can be traditional. It can be uh, community-based. It, it could come from your upbringing. Um, and then the third prompt is to name the relevant concepts or terminologies or ideas that um, that you use to talk about those beliefs. What are the key concepts that you need uh, to use and to define in order to be able to articulate those beliefs? So I'll repeat that. Make a list of three beliefs or ideas about the world and about experience that ground your research. Name the bodies of work or the conversations that relate to or support those beliefs. And then what are the relevant concepts of terminologies? And since the group of students has had the benefit of a little bit of time to think about this, I'm going to invite uh, some of them to just uh, mute yourself and share uh, your, your beliefs and what work and the terminologies. So um, I think that my line of thought comes from the idea that we construct our own understanding and knowledge through experiences and social interactions. Um, context matters and it's through our context and experience that we create our own realities, which is different for each person. And um, through these realities, we place a meaning on these different life events and phenomena. So then for the second part, I um, am really drawn towards uh, theorists like Vygotsky, Braffenbrenner, and frameworks like the developmental niche. And then terminology that stands out to me is context and culture. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Megan. Yeah, that's very consistent. Makes a lot of sense. Would somebody else like to share? I can share. Um, for the first one, so a list of three beliefs or ideas um, which help ground uh, my research. Um, the world as uh, interconnected, uh, meaning as being co-created, and then human beings as individuals who are engaging in a meaning-making quest. Um, some bodies of work which relate to or support these beliefs are sort of this idea of a uh, curriculum of consciousness, uh, some work by Maxine Green and uh, some dialogic work by uh, Laura Black comes to mind. Uh, and some of the relative terminologies are consciousness and intersectionality. Great. Thanks, Virash. Would somebody else like to share? Maybe one more person? I would like to share um, that I believe that everybody has the ability to learn. Um, some people need um, an invitation into that learning environment or um, ways to access those environments that are currently unavailable to them. And um, what's driving that work, that, that understanding is um, learning more about universal design for learning mm -hmm. and um, culturally sustaining pedagogy. Um, 
culturally sustained pedagogy is coming from Way Toller and King Elliot, but they are working on the, um, they're using the work of Django Paris and um, the Harvard Education Review, culturally relevant um, and sustaining pedagogy. And um, universal design for learning is more like, it started in a special education realm, but it's, it's trying to understand that all students may need different, um, different invitations or different accessibility into learning environments and to see that as a universal invitation for all, all learners. Wonderful. Thank you, Wanda. Great. Thank you for sharing those. I, I will try to return to those as I as I talk to just to make connections with, with your thinking and what you're doing. So the basic idea that I want to put forward as I talk through, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a very hierarchical uh, way of understanding the way that theory works. Um, but I'm going to do that really ultimately to undermine that hierarchy and to kind of turn it on its head and to suggest to you that when we do theory and when we work with theory in education research and in general, we're really always doing theory. And thus the title of this workshop is Theory All the Way Down. And this idea of theories all the way down comes from a Hindu uh, origin story uh, that basically says that the earth is sitting on the backs of, of a group of elephants and that those elephants are standing on a tortoise and that that tortoise is sitting is standing on top, on top of a turtle and that that turtle is standing on top of another turtle and that then it's turtles all the way down. Uh, which is basically in if you wanted to use a kind of Western philosophy uh, sort of concept, um, it's, it's, it's sort of the idea of infinite regress. It's one way of thinking about it. If you're an early childhood educator, you know, you can think of, a, of, of someone who always asks why and why, and then why, and then well, why, 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 right? There's always, there's always something that goes on. And, and the basic premise of what I wanna talk, share with you, these ideas I wanna share with you is that it's really theory all the way down. It's never not theory um, and that, and that these fundamental beliefs uh, and ideas about the world that you've shared, some of which come from scholarly literature, but some of which come from our family traditions, come from our culture, come from the place where we grew up, come from our relationship to land, our relationship to the universe, from our relationship to our families, from our, our wounds as children. Uh, There's lots of many different sources. These fundamental beliefs ultimately uh, can be framed in some sense, uh, in a logical sense and can be framed in order to make sense of the world and to generate academic knowledge, which is what we're sort of in the work of doing here. We may be doing many other things. Uh, some of us are in interaction with the land in other settings. Some of us are doing community-based work that is different, but in, the, in this particular context, I'm talking about the, the labor, the work of producing uh, knowledge that is in conversation with academic communities specifically. So, all of these uh, theories, beliefs, values, orient, orienti orienting frameworks, we could call them many different things, um, are really related to the way we make sense of the world. Um, so at the top of this hierarchy, one way of, again, this is just a, a heuristic, not the only way of making sense of this, but one way of making sense of this is that these general ideas are attached to origin stories. In the case of some of us who come from communities that have origin stories, uh, or, or in, the, in the more kind of academic lingo, they can be attached to grand narratives. So I'm gonna give you some examples of what these are that some of which might be familiar to you, grand narratives or, or orienting frameworks. Um, so one that you know, maybe some of you who are here are, might be familiar with are indigenous uh, origin stories and epistemology. So indigenous origin stories give us a sense for how we relate uh, to one another, to land, and in many ways, uh, ground the way that, for example, some indigenous scholars and some uh, uh, academics who write from different traditions, the way in which they, the starting point from which they depart in order to frame the scholarly work that they want to do. On the other side of that, some of you might have heard, might have come across this concept of positivism. So positivism is also a grand narrative. It's a European grand narrative. It comes from a humanist, a humanist uh, grand narrative. Positivism is the idea that everything that, is, everything that exists, everything that can be observed, exists in some quantity in the world. In other words, everything exists in a positive quantity. 
and that those quantities can be measured and that relationships between the, those measurements can be established, right? So it's basically the, no the notion of objectivity, that we can objectively define these things that exist in the world, that if we can define them, we can measure them. And if we can measure them, we can then establish how they affect the, the, each other. So that's, that's, an, that's another grand narrative, right? That shapes in the way that most scholarly research is done. Another grand narrative is narrativism or interpretivism. And you, you heard this a little bit in both uh, what Viraj and Megan and Wanda shared, particularly in the way that Megan and Viraj talked about, um, is the notion that people interpret their experience and that the truth and knowledge is generated out of the way people makes meaning of, of, of their experiences that they encounter, right? And that narrativism is the notion that people make meaning of those things by telling stories about them and that stories are the foundation of, of knowledge making. That's another grand narrative, it's another sort of way of thinking about the world. Developmentalism is another one that's perhaps quite common in education. So developmentalism, uh, you know, it's the underlying assumption underneath adult development, child development, it's the, the you know, global development, is the notion that everything in the world is in a constant movement towards improvement and that there's a stage process through which things improve, right? that the, the human subject is born and then develops into a child and an adolescent and then an adult, and that and that that, that linear progression is, a, is aligned towards improvement. Stage, right? That's that's right now. It is developmentalism. Another one that is often used in education is dialectic materialism or conflict theory, uh, the Hegelian dialectic of thesis and synthesis and, and, and synthesis, uh, conflict theory. You know, it's a kind of the, the the notion societies evolve by being in conflict. Groups come into conflict, new syntheses arise, and it's, it's a kind of developmentalist, but it's through through conflict that society advances. And, and most of these are attached to the grand narrative of, of liberal humanism, which is the idea that human beings are at the center of the universe, or the center of the world, that history unfolds because humans make it, um, and humans are sort of the, the center of, of history, of, right? It, it, it's humans at the expense of everything else. Everything else is there at the service of humans. The individual subject, right? The notion of individualism, liberal individualism, is also attached to certain kinds of values that we often uh, assume to be, or take for granted, like freedom, uh, uh, like property, uh, uh, like um, uh, freedom, property, democracy, voice, right? This, these are sort of um, ideas that are attached to you. So these are all grand narratives. These are philosophical orientations. There's really no way to prove them. There are ways in which we approach the world, right? Now, grand narratives, these all of these grand narratives have different expressions or manifestations into, theor into theories, into theoretical frameworks. Um, and, and sometimes actually we take these grand narratives so for granted that sometimes we end up contradicting them. So for example, we often uh, see uh, pieces of writing where uh, somebody will say, I'm an interpretivist, I'm a narrativist. But then when they talk about their results, they'll talk about effects. They'll say, you know, this, this, uh, 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 this phenomenon had this effect. Or it caused something to happen. You know, you see this in my work. I talk a lot about the way, for example, the arts are talked about. That even people who have very open interpretivist frameworks, <clears throat> Maxine Green is a case in point, will talk about the arts as if they are a positive uh, force in the world that acts on things and, and has effects on things. So oftentimes there's this contradiction between, on the one hand, an interpretivist framework and the way in which certain things like the arts are seen in the world, there's things as, as actors in the world, as, as substances in the world. And that creates uh, tension, that creates contradiction in the way that uh, arguments are developed. So these grand narratives get expressed in different specific theoretical orientations or what we might think about as schools of thought. So one, one school of thought that at the time seems to be sort of taking hold is relational ontology. Uh, it's this idea that uh, we, we are not individuals, really. Our sense of who we are is actually uh, unfolds through the relationships that we have, that, that relationships are first, that we don't, don't exist outside of relationships. And of course, indigenous people have been thinking about this and have this notion of relationality is very much at the heart of indigenous origin stories. So for indigenous people, the notion of relational ontology is not new for people in the global north who think they invent everything. They think that relational ontology is somehow the hottest thing in the market. But in fact, indigenous people have been writing and talking about 
relation of our relationality for for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, we're just now catching up uh, and realizing that individualism is just an invention that we're not really individuals. So, so that's a theoretical orientation. It's a way of making sense of a very particular set of phenomena, right? Uh, and we might take relational ontology or, or uh, theories of indigenous relationality in order to make sense of something. For example, if you're interested in a classroom, uh, in one that's interested in integrate, integration and universal design, uh, we might think about the ways in which um, the setup of a classroom invites or disinvites right people to participate and we might think of that as a relational process as opposed to a process that has to do with individual capacities so that's a way in which we might apply the theoretical framework uh megan mentioned constructivism or described constructivism in the way that she so this idea that we make the world uh, the, the word social constructionism right that uh, the, the world is a social construction it doesn't exist outside of our own capacity to understand it um, and what we can really ultimately understand is what how that process unfolds, how things come to be constructed as such, how gender is constructed, how race is constructed. There are also schools of thought that emerge out of some of these worldviews. So Marxism is perhaps one of the most famous ones. It, Marxism is oriented through a kind of dialectic materialism or conflict theory. That's the kind of view of the world that, that Marx brings to his thinking. Uh, in the case of Marx, it is a theoretical framework that focuses on class and the ways in which relations to the means of production shape the way that both relate to each other in the world. So that's the, those are the particulars of that theoretical framework or that particular school of thought. New materialism, uh, Marxism sometimes gets framed as the old materialism. <laughs> The new materialism sometimes forgets about the old materialism. Although not uh, the good new materialists don't forget about Marx. They, uh, but the bad ones, they just talk about materialism as if, as if there was no old materialism. But that's that's not the that's not the subject of this talk. So I'll leave that aside. Um, so new materialism is a it's a different way of thinking. Going back to relational ontologies, that is not just humans that make relationships, that materials also make uh, relationships, that we're in relationship to the, ma the materials that surround us, and that those materials also act on the world. Um, in education, psychoanalysis has been a really important school of thought, uh, initially inspired by the work of Freud, but now there's all kinds of different versions of psychoanalysis. And psychoanalysis is interested in the you know, intra-human processes, right? The ways in which our impulses, our emotions, our childhood uh, comes to shape the way that we uh, navigate the world, the way in which we repress uh, certain kinds of impulses and how that then manifests in conflict in society and the way that we interact. So psychoanalysis is another very important framework. Um, systems theory, I think, Viraj, in your, you, you talked a little bit about you know, the notion of the world being interconnected is sort of part of systems theory. Uh, it's uh, associated often with Emmanuel Wallerstein. Uh, is this notion that uh, society and the world are organized as a series of systems and that all of these systems are connected to each other and that, that one changing one system affects another system. Post-structuralism also, I think it's another one that's kind of sort of school of thought that's often uh, associated with Michel Foucault. Um, but certain and, and sometimes with psychoanalysis, there are different brands of post-structuralism. But again, this is a another theoretical framework. So what I want to highlight here is that these schools of thought also don't come out of anywhere. That these schools of thought are attached to certain kinds of ways of seeing the world, um, and and that oftentimes that doesn't have to be articulated, right? So when you read the work of a, a scholar that's using a Marxist framework. They don't necessarily specify that they're doing a work that is informed by dialectical materialism, by conflict theory. It goes without saying in a lot of ways. And that's sometimes why uh, uh, inconsistencies unfold, particularly as, as, as new readers engage this work. And because in a very field location, we don't necessarily are uh, disciplined into a background, right? So if you're a sociologist and you're trained as a sociologist or an anthropologist, sometimes those disciplines will give you the introduction that you need in order to understand where Marx is coming from. But in education, because of the art hockery, uh, which then is both a strength and a weakness, we sometimes don't necessarily have the background to be able to know, you know, 
why does Marx see the world the way that Marx sees the world? Um, we, we often come at it uh, uh, in a dangerous, superficial way. And it's important to ground ourselves and to acknowledge um, where the ideas come from, uh, particularly when we're bringing ideas together. So these theoretical for orientations of schools of thought sometimes then get articulated into very specific frameworks. Uh, and I know that uh, some of you read Maxwell's chapter on theoretical frameworks. And theoretical are really the, the, the point which schools of thought and grant get into the nitty gritty of actually doing research because the theoretical frameworks are where we name the concepts and the relationships between concepts, right? We make postulations about how concepts are related to one another. Um, and these are the frameworks that then help us to make sense of the phenomenon that we're trying to understand and that we're trying to write about, that we're trying to produce knowledge of. In sociology, we sometimes, and that's kind of my background, we sometimes call these middle range theories. Um, but don't, don't get too, too hung up on that notion of middle range. Uh, I think mostly the concept of middle range is a way to make sense of the fact that between these theoretical frameworks that are sort of these uh, big ideas and the observations that we make and the way we analyze those observations, there's a link, there's a conceptual framework that links between the way we're oriented to the world, our belief systems, and the observations and the analysis that we make of the phenomenons and the phenomena that we're interested in, in exploring. So we can think of a couple that might be familiar to some of you. I've, you know, you'll have to forgive me. I've, I've, I've named the ones that I'm most familiar with because I want to be able to talk to you with confidence, but there's obviously lots of uh, middle range theories that could be named um, and, and that you may come across. Um, especially in education, if you have a psychological background in, in psychology, uh, you're going to come across a whole set of middle range theories um, that that are relevant that could potentially be relevant to your work. So one one sort of framework is critical race theory. I've named some of the authors that are most often associated with with these middle range theories or frameworks. Um, Derek Bell, Patricia Hill Collins. This reference group theory. Um, in some ways, uh, Wanda, your work probably evokes reference group theory in the sense of being invited. So the uh, reference group theory is this idea that we make sense, we make meaning by being invited into being, um, into associating ourselves with particular groups and then we sort of internalize what that group says we are. So I grew up in Puerto Rico, so my reference group is Puerto Ricans and then I, I'm in a relationship to that reference group, that sort of reference group theory. And similar, we can say that the classroom is a reference group. So that's one sort of theoretical framework that is somewhat relevant to that. In my work, I use a lot of social identity theory. Uh, social identity theory uh, is a theoretical framework that helps us make sense of how people come to internalize who they believe they are and how they make sense of what others believe of them. Uh, so in my own work, I did a lot of work on elites and how, how elites, how students who attend really elite schools, how do they convince themselves that they deserve all that privilege? What stories do they tell themselves? So this is sort of social identity theory. Pierre Bourdieu, Stuart Hall, others. There's a plethora now, actually, I think we're in a good time for thinking about this because there's a lot of different frameworks for thinking about colonialism. Uh, some of them are old, uh, some of them are, you know, Fanon and uh, Amilcar Cabral and, and Messeser have been writing about colonization for a hundred, well, not them for years, but people have been writing about colonization for a long time. Uh, there's different frame, theoretical frameworks that are used to make sense of the experience of colonization, process of colonization, uh, the notion of coloniality, which is uh, has emerged out of Latin America, out of the work of Aníbal Quijano and Silvia Winter and Nelson Maldonado Torres. Uh, where I am in, in my context, the framework of settler colonialism is incredibly important uh, in order to be able to make sense of the state and in the United States, to make sense of nation states like the United States and Canada. Settler colonialism is very important. Um, and there's also frameworks around decolonization, which some people would say uh, decolonization per se is not a analytic framework, it's more of a, an act, a framework for action. Uh, and, and those two sometimes get confused. And this, this is often a problem that, that comes up. For example, you'll notice that I, I haven't listed here a framework that I'm quite used, quite familiar with, which is critical pedagogy. I don't tend to think of critical pedagogy as an analytic framework. I tend to think of critical pedagogy as a framework for action. And those two oftentimes get confused in, in research. 
World systems theory is a variant of systems theory, which I mentioned before, uh, Emmanuel Wallenstein. Stein point theory is an interesting theoretical framework because there's a lot of variations of it. Um, the original Marx actually was sort of the first to articulate the notion of standpoint theory by saying that the working class has a particular view on society by virtue of their position of being of their standpoint as working class. And then that theory has evolved uh, through feminism, particularly feminist standpoint theory is the one that is sort of more familiar. But I actually very recently became uh, heard and read a little bit about something called animal standpoint theory, which I found really interesting, this notion that animals have a particular experience of the world and that as human beings, we should make an effort to try to understand animal subjectivity. Found it really interesting. So now uh, this notion of standpoint theory has sort of traveled to different. Um, but again, it's the notion that you you experience the world from your standpoint, that you stand in a point in place and that you have a perspective on the world that is unique to that standpoint. It, uh, so the, the easiest way to articulate that, the, you know, going back to the critical race theory, is that those who are in the receiving end of racism understand racism differently, and in fact, in a more complex matter than those who are in the giving end of in the those who benefit from racism. So white subjects who benefit from racism don't understand racism precisely because of where they stand in society. So. These uh, middle range or conceptual frameworks, these, uh, uh, if we think about conceptual frameworks as, as being concepts and then propositions about the relationships between those concepts, then turn into the way that we observe, right? And again, this is where oftentimes there, there is inconsistency in research design and in research arguments, where there's a very sophisticated theoretical framework that unfolds but then the way that this is mobilized and turned into concepts that are then used in order to do research is inconsistent. So for example, this is, this is a, a one example that is highly debated, highly contested uh, within, for example, critical race theory. Critical race theory as a framework says that race is a social construct. There's no such thing as race, uh, uh, there's no such thing in nature as race, race, and that race is in, inherited, inherent to the society we live in that it operates through race as an as a, as a apparently natural dimension, right? That society makes race appear natural. And yet often one of the really sort of uh, sticky points about this is whether then we should talk about race as a category. So even to talk about black students, white students is to in fact invoke a category that is non-existent. So this creates attention analytically Right? When you say you're talking about quote unquote white people or black people, if that is an, a social construct, then how do you operationalize it as a criteria or as a category? Right? Different scholars have different ways of addressing that, uh, right? And different ways of dealing with that tension. But it's one of the ways in which sometimes the way in which we use concepts uh, needs to be consistent with the premises of the theoretical frameworks that we're, that we're using, right? So these concepts, uh, observations, and data, each theoretical framework has a set of concepts that help us make sense of the phenomenon that we're thinking of. So race theory, again, we make this uh, understand that race is an ordering device. We understand that race operates intersectionally as a, as a form of oppression, which means that it interacts with other forms of oppression like patriarchy and ableism and classism. Uh, we use the concept of interest convergence, which is the notion that you can't resolve the problems of racism by trying to find common ground between those who benefit from racism and those who suffer from racism, because when the interests converge, ultimately whites benefit. <laughs> this is Derek Bell's argument. And these are different. So whiteness, the notion of whiteness as property, the notion of the racial contract, these are all concepts that we use in critical race theory in order to make sense of the world and make sense of the phenomenon we're trying to study. The one I'm most familiar with, because it's the one I work within, is uh, cultural production theory. We tend to think of cultural production as operating in different orders. We think of the material order, the single order, the affective order, special temporal order. Each of those orders has different concepts. So if I'm out there in the field trying to make sense of a way of the way that a group of people come together in order to create an artifact, 
I'm not interested in the beauty of the artifact. I'm not interested in whether the artifact is creative or not. I'm interested in the material conditions that make the artifact possible. I'm interested in the affective dimensions of how people come together. I'm interested in the dimensions of space-time that unfold through the, through the process of making things. So that's another example of uh, applying a theoretical framework. With regards to colonialism, these are, again, relevant concepts. Imperialism, land and land theft. What is a settler? It's, again, uh, uh, this is another very contested concept within different theories of colonialism. Different theories of colonialism have a different understanding of what, a, what constitutes a settler, for example. Sometimes there's hot and angry debates about what constitutes a settler. Um, concepts of appropriation, er indigenous erasure. Uh, even about the concept of indigeneity itself, right? Some indigenous scholars won't use the word indigenous because they understand the word indigenous as itself a colonial construct. Right. You know, the notion that I, I didn't become indigenous until you came to colonize me. Um, not and in relationship to settler, these notions about endogenous others. So again, these are concepts, criteria uh, uh, that help us make sense of the world and that are linked to these theoretical frameworks and then linked to grand narratives. And so whatever we're observing, right, if we are interested, for example, if we're doing research on, uh, in my case, for the last 10 years, I've been doing work in schools with Latinx immigrants and indigenous youth here in Toronto. And so even the way that I frame the work that I'm doing in a classroom requires that I use these labels, immigrant, indigenous youth, youth, the, you know, youth itself as a concept participation, right? these are concepts that I use in order to frame, in order to make my work possible in the field, I need these concepts. But these concepts are ultimately all theory. They're all theory. And so we go all the way back to the top and we could take this thing and flip it on the top and start from the way I observe the world and end at the grand narratives. And I could have done this that way as well, start from the grounded of experience up to the um, orienting beliefs. And of course, it also comes down, right? And so the important thing when you're developing your work, theoretically, is to remember that is theory all the way down and all the way up. And that you're always traveling and making sense and finding consistency between the way that you think about the way you're oriented to the world, what make, how do you make sense of it, and the way you are then observing and analyzing that world and making arguments about it. And that you use that in order to support the arguments that you're making with theory um, in the work that you're doing, whether it's dissertation, your MA thesis, the article you want to get published, your op-ed commentary, whatever piece of writing, right? Again, to go back to the beginning, this is a framework for thinking about writing. So I should be able to, as a reader, read what you're writing and be able to trace the way in which, the way in which you observe the world, the way in which your talk about the work is informed, the orienting beliefs, the theoretical framework, the middle range theories should all be sort of consistent. Whether I agree with it or not, right? Whether I agree with it or not. It's and and uh, in fact, it is often a lot of fun as a, as a, as a scholar to try to tease apart um, whether we agree with an argument or not, to try to tease apart where, where are the gaps in logic? Where are the places where, where the logic doesn't match? Or to try to uh, deconstruct the logic that a given article or a given author is using in order to make an argument. Um, oftentimes it's actually the best way to, uh, to debate uh, people who hold normative views about things is to just sort of say, yeah, that just doesn't follow. <laughs> uh, can be a lot of fun. Anyways, so that's, that's that. That's for me. Hopefully that was about 30 minutes. Uh, I'm sorry. Again, I know that I'm glossing over and, and I'm putting things into buckets that I imagine some people will take issue with the way I put them into buckets. Uh, hopefully the heuristic is helpful uh, to and the point, which is only that, that all of this has to be connected. All of it has to be connected. And that you have to be aware, especially when you are 
working theoretically in an ad hoc fashion, right? Where you're borrowing concepts. I want to borrow these concepts from critical race theory. And I want to borrow these concepts from feminist theory. And I want to borrow these concepts from Marxist theory in order to make sense, right? Of this particular colonial situation that you have to be aware that you're introducing, potentially introducing inconsistencies and, and lapses that could make your work difficult to understand. And ultimately you want to be understood and you want to be able to make a contribution that helps you know, in the pursuit of better and more equal education opportunities. I'll stop there. I hopefully I didn't. Uh, hopefully there's a little bit of time. We'll see. Uh, I know. We're, I think we're only till seven thirty. So, anyways, I'll, I'll pause. And hopefully I didn't uh, uh, make you dizzy with all these images around me. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So we're going to um, open up to this some time. I think we have some time for questions and answers, and we'll have some from, from our class. Uh, but then also we want to bring in um, anyone else's. So if you want to pop it in the question and answer space, or if you wanted to um, jump in the, the chat, I'm going to turn the time over to uh, Viraj, who's going to open us up uh, for a little bit of discussion time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gazdambide Fernandez. Um, one of the first questions that uh, was submitted via the uh, Q&A function is, um, why, as I'm listening to you, am I troubled by being consistent or by consistency? What do we lose uh, by being consistent and how do we identify blind spots outside of the consistency? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great, uh, that's a very provocative. A good question. So I'll give I'll give a couple of different interests to think about this. Maybe not an answer, but just ways of thinking about this. The first one is again is to is to say that uh, the piece about consistency is important for the particular task of producing knowledge that presumably advances a cause. Uh, yes, we can sometimes advance causes by being inconsistent and by and by exposing contradiction. Yes, we can do that. Uh, it doesn't work very well when you're trying to publish an article or when, whether, when you're trying to use uh, the written word, whether it's, a, whether it's a journal article or whether it's a, a piece of writing for a website or whether, whatever it is, uh, maybe not poetry. We can be inconsistent when we, write, when we write poetry and poetry can be incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful for advancing causes, right? Um, and, and that would be a really good place to be utterly inconsistent and to use inconsistency in order to make a point, in order to advance a cause, in order to provoke, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm articulating this and, and, and emphasizing consistency for this particular genre that we're talking about, uh, that is academic writing, writing dissertations, writing in my theses. Uh, yeah, sometimes it, it might be a good thing to be inconsistent. I, um, and I think that because we are inconsistent, right? And we, and we can, in fact, hold different viewpoints and different values at the same time, right? Because we're human beings and we're fallible and, and we're imperfect. Uh, and because we navigate different contexts and, different co and have different commitments that sometimes are in contradiction with each other. And so I don't, want to, I don't want to give the impression that I'm saying that we as individuals have to be consistent or that even our relationships have to be consistent. Uh, at all, uh, I, I am more. I'm specifically talking about this particular genre of communicating ideas that we call academic writing. Absolutely, um, no, you're absolutely correct. Sometimes those tensions, those contention, contentions, or inconsistency, inconsistencies are necessary in order to move some of the ideas forward or potentially give us new ways of looking. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, being consistent is important. Consistent is important. Along with that, um, a question I have is: How can we potentially identify or stay consistent within qualitative frameworks uh, of theories? Because for a lot of positivist frameworks, it might be easier to be consistent throughout. So, what are some of your recommendations there? Yeah, that's that, that's a good question. It is a lot easier as an as a scholar or some academic to stay within normative frameworks. That's why they're normative, right? And that's why they, they hold so much power. You don't have to explain yourself quite. If you're, if you're doing log regressions and correlation analysis, you don't have to explain yourself quite as much. In fact, you very, very basically don't have to explain anything. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, we, and, and also if you're speaking to an audience that is familiar with those frameworks, then you have more explaining to do. So 
usually the advice, and I'll, I'll take this question also in um, from the perspective of an, of an editor, is to think about audience. Yes. So as, as a scholar, as somebody who is committed to the role of knowledge production in advancing social causes, um, you are going to have a lot of different audiences. So when I when I work with um, with teachers, I go about my work very differently. Uh, when I do activism, I do go about my work very differently. When I publish articles, I do about it. So so the challenge of of the owners of explanation depends very much on who you're talking to. If you're talking to an audience of people who hold positivist ideas you're gonna to have to do a lot of work to walk them through the logic if you're doing qualitative research. But if you're trying to publish your work in a journal like Qualitative Inquiry or the Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, you're gonna to have to do a lot less work. You're gonna be able to take a lot for granted uh, and you'll be able to cut to the chase, right? So that question of that work uh, very much depends on the audiences uh, that you're trying to engage and the, uh, the media you're using, you know, if you're if you're using short form, long form, if you're writing for newspapers, if you're writing for the news, if you're talking to a journalist, you know, I, I put a completely different hat on when I'm talking to a journalist and explain things very differently. Um, it's all sound bites, right? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure if that necessarily totally answers that question, but I, I think as, as an editor for me, it's about audience. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it does It does make plenty of sense. Um, Along with that, so we're moving now towards a question regarding some of the contested concepts, contested theoretical frames. So the question is, uh, even as you were sharing, it came to mind how contested these concepts and theoretical frames can be, like the term indigenous or colonial concepts, so thus its rejection. Can you tell us about a time when you wrestled with contested terms or writing up or down theory, and how did you navigate uh, those arenas? Yeah, yeah, of course, we run into this problem all the time. So I give you an example. So I've done a lot of work. A lot of my work uh, has been around arts education. I mentioned a little bit uh, this kind of critical work that I've done, trying to challenge arts educators to shift the logic that they use to make arguments about the arts. I wrote an article called Why the Arts Don't Do Anything. And and so I, in principle, I when I, in my work, I tend to avoid the, the word art and the arts and artists, unless I'm criticizing them. That's only when I evoke them. Uh, and I do that quite deliberately. And I've, I've found over time, I found ways to talk around those words uh, or to talk about them, to use them while also highlighting their contested nature and the effect that using those words have. Um, you know, I sort of make the case that as soon as you invoke uh, a term like the arts, you invoke its history and, and it invariably imposes itself on the thing that you're trying to understand. So in my work sometimes, when I do participatory work, uh, the word, the arts and artists are incredibly important for the communities I'm working with. So I work with a lot of young people who call themselves artists and, and who call their work and, and who talk about their work that they do, their cultural production as the arts. And that for a long time was a really uncomfortable for me because I, I always, particularly when I was uh, <laughs> much uh, newer at this, uh, I immediately tried to engage in a critical conversation with them. And then I realized that I was making a mistake uh, and that I was really invalidating the experience of the young people that presumably, supposedly, I was trying to exalt and that I was missing really the point ultimately. And so I don't, I don't, I don't do that anymore. Um, I allow those words to get used when they need to be used for particular purposes, um, to advance particular kinds of experiences, to make sense of them. Um, and I try to have conversations about what those words mean, but I don't dismiss them. Um, and that was a really tough learning curve for me as somebody who had this sort of critical orientation and, and was aware of the dangers of invoking that kind of language. But that was a situation where I, I realized that I was putting my own orienting frameworks uh, over the way in which the young people that I said that I wasn't supporting <laughs> um, it undermined their work and undermined their experience. And uh, it was a it was a very a very steep learning curve, and I, I had to do a lot of self reflection. <laughs> 
and be like, yeah, 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 this is not, this is not right. Uh, so, so I had to kind of put that on hold. Uh, I also tend to use in my own writing, tend to use race, racial labels with a lot of caution. Um, I follow the lead of uh, black scholars uh, for when, when I use terms like black uh, or white uh, in terms of the way that I phrase them. Uh, Acknowledging, try to use them in, in phrase them in ways that acknowledge their so the nature of their social construction, um, and similar with labels that apply to me, I, I'm, with labels that apply to me or that I use or that generally are get get thrust up on me, I just start to be really playful and, and just mess around with people. Uh, but that's my prerogative to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I think uh, using these categories playfully when it's when it's adequate. Uh, pushing back when it's adequate and then accepting them when it is and being really aware of the social context and the people that you're trying to engage in conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I think our next question is in the chat and it's uh, asking about, is there a reason to aim for a capital T truth as a way to resolve inconsistencies? If not, what are the primary motivations to resolve theoretical inconsistencies outside of pleasing the current powers that be in publishing in academia? <laughs> Is there a reason to aim for capital T truth? <laughs> probably not. Um, I, uh, I, I could probably argue with myself on this one, so, so I won't do that. Um, as a way to resolve inconsistencies. I mean, I think resolving inconsistencies always has a purpose, whether either being consistent or being inconsistent uh, always is always directed towards something. This is how I think about pedagogy. Uh, I think about pedagogy as being um, relational, right? Based on a set of relationships and contextual as being, and as being directed towards something, having, having a goal. Um, and because of that, as being profoundly about ethics, right? It's, it's about the ethics of the encounter with the other and about the ethics of the goals that drive that pedagogical encounter. And so for me, I would answer that question by framing it as pedagogical and, uh, and asking what is the purpose? What, what are we trying to accomplish in the process of seeking to transform each other through a pedagogical encounter does, does seeking a capital T truth have a purpose in, 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 in our encounter with each other and in the pedagogical work that we're trying to do together? Uh, if it does, then let's, 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 let's go for it. Uh, I'm thinking that I do this with my children all the time, especially uh, my youngest child uh, loves to have conversations about capital T truth. <laughs> um, and, and so I think that in, in effect, there is a good reason to aim for capital T truth in those moments where my child and I are trying to make sense of the world. Whether we actually get there, I don't know. <laughs> You'll have to ask them, <laughs> perhaps, um, whether we actually resolve those inconsistencies. But I don't, I, I don't tend to think of this as being an either or, uh, but being quite specific to the relationship that is unfolding in front of me and, and, that, and through which I'm being made and changed. Because that's that's always implies like an inconsistency, right? If okay, so I'll, I'll end by saying this: if the purpose of pedagogy is to change us, if the goal of pedagogy is to change us and the people that and the relationship, the encounter that we're having, then inconsistency is is guaranteed. Because at some point we're going to be no longer what we were before, and it's going to be inconsistent. And and if that is the purpose, then then that's the purpose. Then that's it's always going to be inconsistency. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, following that, I think um, you you commented a little bit uh, earlier uh, during your presentation about uh, some action-driven research compared to more theoretical research. So research which may be considered to be more um, as a research which have, have frameworks, or research frameworks which are more for ac more action-oriented rather than more theory-oriented. Could right. you give um, some guidance potentially to uh, young researchers who may want to engage in action-oriented uh, research or use action-oriented frameworks in order to yeah. go forward. Yeah, that's so important. Um, so I think, first of, first of all, it's really important to know the difference. 
and and sometimes it's the same set of ideas are uh, ways of an analyzing and making sense of something and also ways of acting in the world right ways of directing the way that we go about doing a certain kind of work or or opposing or, or resisting critical race theories i think is actually is a good example so within critical race theory we have concepts that help us make sense of the world the racial contract white property and we have concepts that are about resisting racism so counter narratives right is a concept that is about about resisting racism or about the ways in which we make meaning of the world by resisting the normative narratives. So within critical race theory, we have concepts that are analytic that help us make sense of something. And we have concepts that are that help us develop a sense of resisting that, right? So the important thing is to know the difference. <laughs> um, and I think what I what I would invite, and I, this is hard to sort of give general advice because this really depends on what is the, what are the concepts that you're using uh, and the frameworks that you're using, is to make sure that you ask yourself, what am I? What is what is what is your theory of change? What is it that you think the theory is doing for you? Are you are you using these concepts? And sometimes it, there's nothing wrong with having a combination of concepts. This happens often. This happens a lot with people who are doing work within the field of colonial colonialism or or settler colonial studies or decolonization, right? Um, but understanding colonization is not the same as decolonization. You have to understand colonization in order to decolonize. But lots of people understand colonization and do nothing about it. <laughs> so these are not the same thing, right? So so likewise, critical pedagogy, like it's one thing to have a Marxist phenomenological analysis of the world through which I can make sense of the way that people are positioned in inequality is another to enact a pedagogy that seeks to transform them. And so making sure that those are clear in your mind when you're doing field work is important because, and I'll tell you what the danger is, and then I'll, 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 I'll finish with this. The danger is that if you proceed by trying to make sense of the world through the concepts that help you act in the world, you end up acting on a world that perhaps is not yours to act on. And this is especially important for people who are doing participatory research. Because we because oftentimes what happens is that you go in with an agenda, even though you claim you don't. And I learned this firsthand. Even though you claim you don't have an agenda and that you're and that you're there to work on behalf of the community, you you do have, you do have one. And oftentimes this is where it gets articulated, is that the concepts for action get confused for analytic concepts. And so having not knowing that difference is really important, especially when you're doing participatory work. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Raj, for for uh uh rolling doing our discussant role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. That was great. Good job. Really, really good job. Appreciate it. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Gazzapaiti uh, Fernandez uh, for joining us, for helping us think through theory all the way down, turtles all the way down. <laughs> um, that is going to be the way that we refer to this the rest of the semester for us <laughs> and our group. And uh, it's been very, very helpful. And you can see that in the chat now too. Um, others agree. Uh, if um, if you want to sign up for um, any more sessions, you can still do that. The registration for other our other sessions are, is still open. I put the link in a, a minute early, uh, a minute ago. <laughs> and please join me in thanking Dr. Society Fernandez. Thank you. Thank, thanks really, for the really Anna, helpful. Thanks, Viraj, and thanks, uh, Wanda and Megan, for volunteering your your thoughts to get the conversation going. And good luck. Good luck with your class. And thanks. Awesome. Everybody. Thank you so much.